Stone Brothers Production. Hello all, welcome back to the Serial Killer series. Today I'll be talking about six serial killers in Georgia, so let's get right into this. Number six, James Walraven, aka the Bathtub Strangler. Nothing is really known about Walraven's early life, but his first murder started on April 15th, 1981 when police found 22-year-old Luis Del Santo. She was sexually assaulted and strangled by the hands of Walraven before her body was dumped face down with very hot water in her bathtub. His second victim, Giselle Clardy, an assistant manager of Cherry Hill Apartments in DeKalb County, left her office to post certain notices about inspecting a vacant apartment. An auto mechanic named James Buffington was working in a parking lot near Building U and saw Clardy driving into a parking lot shortly after 4 p.m. and saw a car behind her with two men inside. Both the suspicious man and Clardy walked out of sight towards Building U. Ten minutes later, the man ran back to the car alone and got in and departed in a hurry. Clardy didn't report into work the next day and her body was discovered that morning in apartment U1. She was laying face down in the bathtub with three to four inches of water like his previous victim. The cause of death was strangulation and the autopsy report determined she was sexually attacked beforehand. On June 15, 1981, a third victim, Patricia Berry, age 22, was found dead the same way like the two previous victims. She was found at the Windermere apartment complex located at Roswell Road in Fulton County, Georgia. While Raven attempted to kill two more people but left the scene of the same apartment complex where victim Barry was murdered, two witnesses saw the suspect in the apartment complex and were able to come up with a good tip to catch 32 unemployed tennis bum Samuel Walraven who hung out at public tennis courts between DeKalb and Atlanta, Georgia. Walraven was detained on July 14, 1981 and was charged with all five crimes and was sentenced to death but was reversed to life imprisonment. Number 5. William Hans. Nothing is known about Hans's early life, but his date of murders was between 1977 and 1978 and his victims were all prostitutes. On September 16, 1977, the nude body of Karen Hickman, aged 24, was found at Fort Benning near Columbus, Georgia. She had been beaten and ran over with a car, but no real clues or leads were developed. The murder was put on the back burner because there was a presence of a serial killer named Carlton Gary who was operating there at the time. That serial strangler caused a big deal in that city because the victims were all elderly white women. Even though he wasn't caught at the time, evidence determined that the killer was black. Hans decided to take advantage of the situation by not getting any attention from his own crimes. He sent a letter to Columbus authorities on March of 1978 claiming to be in a white radical group vowing a black woman would die if authorities could not locate the strangler. Hans stated that the group had already kidnapped a second prostitute named Gail Jackson and would be killing her soon. Authorities found out that she was missing too, but by that time, Hans had already killed her and was trying to hide his tracks. He sent another letter about a week later asking for a ransom for the exchange of Jackson's release. When there was no reply, a third letter was sent stating that a victim named Irene had been abducted and she would die on June 1st. Authorities found out that Irene Thurkild was also missing and she was last seen with a black soldier on March 16, 1981. Authorities figured out that someone from the military base was responsible for the letters and abductions. Jackson wasn't the second victim's real name and her name was proven to be Brenda Farson. She was found with her skull crushed on March 30th in a shallow grave outside of the military base. A few days later an anonymous caller led military police to Thurkeel's headless body hidden behind a few logs by a rifle range. It wasn't long before authorities determined that Hans was a soldier seen with Thurkeel and he was arrested shortly after confessing to all three murders. William Hans stood trial for the murders of Jackson and Farson in a civilian court. Hans was found guilty and sentenced to death. Hans was put to death by electrocution on March 31, 1994. Number 4. Injet Lyles. Lyles was born on August 23, 1925 in Mackin, Georgia, the only daughter of her two parents. She had a charming personality where she would bend people to her will. In 1947, she married her first husband who owned a restaurant downtown Mackin. Lyles had two children with her first husband. Her first child, Marcia, was born in 1948 and Clara, who was born in 1951. Both Lyles and her husband ran the company with massive success with great customer service. Her husband sold the restaurant due to his failing health and he made his move without consulting her and she never forgave him. As his health worsened, his doctor never knew what his sickness was. It happened at random and after his death, his autopsy ruled that he had encephalitis. Both were known to have fought a lot in their home, which was a hint of why his health took a massive decline. With her husband's passing, she moved into her parents' place and took both her daughters with her. She saved every penny she could as a waitress in hopes to own her own restaurant again. 
She raised enough money eventually and bought back her late husband's restaurant in April of 1955 and renamed it to Jet's Restaurant. She quickly became the hottest restaurant in town, though no one still knew about how her husband died so quickly. Lyle started dating Joe Neal Gabber and married him in New Mexico to surprise family and friends. Soon after, Joe was in an accident and needed minor surgery on his wrist and developed a terrible rash and high fever afterwards. Her previous husband's doctor wasn't able to diagnose Gabbard's problem and he continued to get sicker and he died on December 2, 1955. She changed her name soon after her husband's death back to Lyle's, which was her first husband's name. She also received life insurance money and she used that money to buy a new car and a house. She sparked bad gossip when she began dating another Capital Airways pilot. She even convinced her mother-in-law, Julia Lyles, to move in with her because she was lonely and wanted to be closer to her grandchildren. And Jet found out that she had a considerable amount of wealth and she pestered her to make a will for her, which Lyles refused to do so. Her mother-in-law became superstitious because of her daughter-in-law's asking her to make a will for her. And Jet became sick of her mother-in-law and started bringing her favorite snacks and desserts from in Jet's restaurant. She became ill soon after that and died on September 29, 1957 and was buried beside her husband and son. A week later, Jet convinced the state to give her mother-in-law's estate to her and her daughters, which she was approved of her request. It wasn't until her own daughter drew ill in late winter of 1958 when town folks became suspicious of all the deaths close to her. After a month-long stay at the hospital, Marcia, her 9-year-old daughter, died on April 4, 1958. Her body was investigated because of all the townspeople's suspicion and they found out that she had died from arsenic poisoning. A search of Jet's house showed that she had several boxes of ant poison containing arsenic along with voodoo paraphernalia. Jet was arrested and charged with four counts of murder and attracted worldwide attention. She was the first woman to be sentenced to death in the state of Georgia but it was overturned after long hearings and she was transferred to a state hospital for the mentally insane. She stayed the rest of her life in a state mental hospital until her death from a heart attack on December 4th, 1977. Number 3 Janie Gibbs Gibbs was married at the age of 15 and was a grandmother by the age of 34. She was known for being soft-spoken and she was renowned for her religious fervor in Cordelli, Georgia where she taught Sunday school. Also, she served a lot of church committees. While she wasn't engaged in church work, Janie's favorite thing to do was cooking for her family. Unfortunately, some of her dishes didn't settle well with her husband Charles or the younger kids both being boys. Within a two-year period, her husband being a farmer and her two boys died in the same fashion to gruesome convulsions. Their passing got her a total of $31,000 in life insurance policies and she gave 10% of the money to her church. Insurance adjusters grew suspicious, suggesting of an autopsy, but she refused to have her loved ones cut open. Finally, after a sudden death of her eldest son and infant grandson, Gibbs' daughter-in-law fought back to exercise her rights to get an authorized autopsy. Arsenic was found in all five bodies finally exhumed under court orders. Janie Gibbs was arrested on Christmas Eve of 1967 and was charged with five counts of first degree murder. In February of 1968, she was found insane and served time in a mental hospital until 1976. After her release, she was convicted of all five family members and received five life sentences. Gibbs was released in April of 1999 after suffering from Parkinson's disease in her later prison years. Gibbs remained on parole and was required to check in once per year due to being clinically insane. She lived in a nursing home in Douglasville, Georgia until her death on February 7, 2010. Number 2 Michael Terry Terry was born in 1960. Terry started under police's radar in 1985 when Curtis Brown, a 21-year-old male, left his home to buy a pack of cigarettes and went missing. He was found five hours later with his ID stripped and his pants pulled down. They also found out that the victim was shot several times in the head with 38 caliber bullets. His body wasn't identified until four days later when his girlfriend filed a missing person report with the police. Employees recognized him but only knew him as Big Mike leaving with Curtis Brown. From there on out, the trail went cold and there was no time to spare for chasing the unknown target. The murder had captured national spotlight around this time before 1980 through 1984. Another similar murder took place about 10 months later in mid-October of 1986 when the decomposing body of a young black man was found in the same fashion. Darrell Williams, a 21-year-old black man, was found with bullets ridden in his head with his pants below his knees. He was last seen alive at a bar on October 5th. Another male victim died in a similar fashion and they linked him with the other similar death of Williams. The other victim was a family man this time though and he never returned after doing some errands. 
The same pistol was used on him as of Williams who died in mid-October. Three more victims died in a similar fashion throughout 1985 and 1986. They were all linked together made with the connection of the detectives. All three males were either street hustlers or male prostitutes and they were all slain in an execution style with a gun or knife. Some with their necks stabbed and others with bullets in their head. The first and last victim who were unrelated died in similar areas and abandoned buildings. A witness recalled the same description of a gas station attendant as a big guy who was known as the same description. Police renewed the investigation and found out where he had been roaming for the past year. They had found out that he had been collecting a numerous amount of guns and he pawned a few when he ran short of cash. Terry was arrested when he was at work in a tire capping shop and he had hit a 357 Magnum when he was hauled in for questioning. In his confession Terry stated he met most of his victims in salons and others through other means. He stated that they threatened him with robbery or worse so he killed them in self defense but it did not convince the jury or detectives of his lies. He stated to them that he was taken advantage of. There is no way the victims could have taken advantage of Terry because of his massive size and being over 300 pounds. In the end, Terry was only charged with two life terms in prison without parole for the murders of Richard Williams and Curtis Brown, although he had the possibility of his sentence being shortened on appeal. Number 1. Alana Ripper, an unknown serial killer. On May 28, 1911, a body of an African American woman named Bella Walker was found 25 yards from her home. She was found by her sister on Sunday morning with her throat cut decaying in the street after she failed to return home the night before from her job as a cook at a home on Cooper Street. About one month later, two more African American women were found with their throats slashed in a similar fashion as Bell's. The sad fact that not a lot was done due to racism being prevalent around this time. Any reported incidents were slipped through the cracks of any investigations. One woman who escaped the killer stated that it was a tall black man who towered her. Police arrested multiple black men who fit the description but there was not enough evidence or probable cause to go off of. The only thing police got out of it was more black women being murdered in a similar fashion, some having their throat slit so deep that they were nearly decapitated. A lot of the black community hid because of the killer and the police's racism in arresting any black person they saw that matched the serial killer's description. What made matters worse is that the serial killer would just kill with one blow from slicing a victim's throat from ear to ear after pulling back their heads. The serial killer would choose random locations every single time. A lot of lies were made on the newspapers even with one stating that the killer could be a white man disguised as a black man but they were known as false claims. By the end of 1911, 15 dark-skinned women were dead. The total number was believed to be over 21 victims. The Atlanta Ripper was never caught and the police and victims never got their justice. All the community got was more false news and a close to the case. Hello everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please slam that like button, share, and subscribe because it really helps me continue making these videos. If you can, can you make sure to turn on the bell below the video because sometimes it doesn't notify people when I upload my videos. Next on our list is Hawaii, so mahalo and see you next time.